Okay. Welcome to the, uh, 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 the Computer Security Seminar from uh, Purdue University. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Kelly Kane from Indiana University. <laughs> and sh she will speak on human factors approach to preserving privacy. Kelly. Thank you very much. So I, I, I'm not sure that this is going to be uh, exactly the same as some of the other talks that, that you may have heard uh, earlier. My, my background is uh, in psychology. I'm, I'm trained as a psychologist. So I, I come to the problem of security and privacy from a slightly different perspective, but I hope that, that you all will find that <coughs> useful today. One of the things that I'm really interested in is understanding everyday privacy behaviors. So this is an example of an everyday privacy behavior that I think we as computer scientists and designers can learn from. I'll blow it up a little bit so maybe you can see it a little bit more. What this is is uh, a, an Apple notebook. And if you are familiar with apples, they have a little webcam right in the middle of them. And this one does have a webcam on it, but it's covered with an adorable little alien sticker. And I was fascinated when I saw this little alien sticker over the, the webcam. And I asked the, the owner of the, the laptop why that was there. And she told me it was there because she didn't know if someone could possibly be watching her on that webcam when she was doing any of the things that she would normally be doing on her computer. So maybe it was just laying on her couch, typing an email. Maybe it was that the, the computer was sitting open on her desk while she walked around at school. Maybe it was that it was sitting in her, in her bedroom and she didn't close it. Uh, but at any rate, she was worried enough about this idea that somebody could potentially be watching it, even if she turned it off using whatever mechanism on the, the, the computer that you can use to turn it off, she was worried that somebody still might be able to get in there and see her. So from a psychological perspective, I found this a really interesting everyday privacy behavior. And so I think that these are the kinds of things that we can learn from and uh, potentially can have implications for security research. So today I'll be talking about everyday privacy behaviors. I've given you sort of some of the reasons why I'm interested in everyday privacy behaviors. I'll talk about a study that I did as part of my dissertation on everyday privacy behaviors. Um, I'll talk about some of the results in terms of design that came out of that study, uh, and also some of the theoretical implications. So another area that I'm interested in is how we can apply um, these sorts of findings to theories of privacy. Then I'll talk about Critical misclosure incidents, misclosure is a, is a term I've coined to describe a particular um, error in disclosure, and I'll, I'll outline that uh, later during the talk. And then a study that I did of critical misclosure incidents, and I think this, will, this is something that will probably make sense to you um, when I start talking about it, and you'll, you'll probably all think, oh, okay, I've, I've done that before, I know what she's talking about. Then I'll talk about some design implications, really very basic things that can be done to prevent misclosures, and also how that, uh, the idea of misclosure applies um, to theory. So why is it important to understand behavior? From my perspective, which is, as I mentioned, a psychological perspective, uh, this, is, this is how we understand privacy at a, at a user level, right? If we understand what people mean when they talk about privacy, we have a much better idea about how we can design for privacy. It's also complementary to other approaches, uh, such as security approaches and policy approaches, and can potentially inform, um, which can potentially inform each other. So the questions I'm going to be talking about in, this, in the research study that I'll be presenting is what are users' everyday privacy behavior? So what are the kinds of things that people are already doing to manage their privacy day to day? Do those behaviors differ across age? So I was interested in a younger and older adu adult populations? And do the behaviors differ across groupings or types of technologies? To address these questions, I ran eight focus groups that were about three hours each. Um, I had two, uh, two different age groups, younger and adults, that were all college students, and they were, um, you know, on average 21. And the older adults were, um, on average, about 69 years old. This resulted in quite a lot of data, over 500 pages of transcribed verbatim text, 
Um, and then on that data, I performed extensive qualitative and quantitative uh, analyses. To elicit discussion, I used six scenarios that were uh, garnered from the privacy, primarily privacy and HCI literature that had been shown before to have potential privacy issues associated with them. So the first one was photo sharing. Um, the next one was identity theft, health disclosure, location tracking, surveillance, and self-disclosure and relationship building. So what I did was present one of these scenarios and then ask the group to talk about you know, potential privacy issues that they would have with, with in, in, any of these scenarios. After I ended up with the transcribed verbatim text, I analyzed that using a, a qualitative data analysis program using MaxQDA, ended up with high inner rater um, reliability on the eventual codes that, uh, that we found at the high and low level. I'll talk about the results. I'll break those out into two different um, areas, the qualitative results and the quantitative results. I'm going to split those up starting with the qualitative results. One of the main findings was that there were three sort of high-level privacy behaviors that people described during the focus group sessions. The first, the first group were avoidance behaviors, where people avoided situations where privacy might be a concern. This included avoiding listening to other people, avoiding using a device or system, censoring themselves where they refused to perform some action or refused to say something because of privacy concerns, um, physically hiding from other people, and engaging um, in what I called selective sharing, which is sharing with specific people or only sharing parts of information. And I can give you some examples of these in just a minute. The second group of behaviors were modification behaviors. Um, this included this general idea of kind of being careful, um, altering what someone was saying for a particular audience, performing actions but not in front of other people, doing something or saying something quietly, and using a code or different language. This is while you're in already involved in a behavior. This is modifying what you're doing. The third group of behaviors were alleviatory behaviors, and this is something after an act has already occurred or after someone has already said something, then they will take these alleviatory actions to sort of reduce privacy uh, issues after the fact. So if we were talking about um, a, an image on Facebook, you could ask someone, whoever had, had posted the image on Facebook, to remove it. Um, you could ask someone not to share information any further. You could check back. Um, to see whether or not information had been shared or to check to see it, if it was the information or in the form that you wanted it to be. Um, people talked about destroying evidence um, after the fact and limiting distribution. So I have a few examples of these. Um, one participant described censoring herself. Um, she says, you know, if you're in an elevator and maybe there's a security camera, if it's really obvious, you, you're getting conscious and um, about what you're standing, so you're not going to scratch yourself in front of the camera, right? So she's actually not going to perform an action. because She's going to avoid a situation where p potentially she would be worried about her privacy because of the camera being in the elevator. This participant uh, avoided using a particular system. In this case, it, it was a messaging system. He switched from using AIM to Trillion because in the past he uh, he had sent messages to the wrong person using AIM, and he didn't have this problem when he used Trillion. Um, this participant described performing actions but not in front of other people. So um, she had an appointment, and the, the doctor's office called her, um, to, to, called her back to confirm the appointment, and she was in a room with three other people when they called, and so she went out into the hallway to, to do what it was that she wanted to do, but not in front of other people. Being vague was something that was um, a recurring theme. People sometimes just said, oh, you know, I'll be vague if I'm talking about something that has particular privacy implications. Um, they also said, I'll be really general. I won't go in, into any detail or not explain things fully. Um, I might skip a little bit through, but people did also say destroy evidence. So after they've already given out information, then they'll go back and potentially destroy pieces of information. And in terms of privacy behavior, I, I found that you know, pretty interesting that somebody was willing to like burn, burn photos or something of themselves. 
So again, there were three high levels of, of behaviors that emerged across all of these different uh, scenarios and across people. And so now I'll move more into the, the quantitative analysis of these behaviors. The most frequently reported behavior category was avoidance. So um, most often people reported that they would avoid a situation where privacy was a concern. Um, modification was, was second, and alleviatory behaviors were um, the least frequently reported behaviors, but still reported with, with, with some frequency. Between younger and older adults, there were some differences in how often people reported these different behaviors. So older adults reported avoiding situations where privacy would be a concern more often than younger adults did, whereas uh, younger adults reported engaging in more alleviatory behaviors versus older adults. As you recall, I was also interested in understanding if behaviors differed across technologies, and indeed in some cases behaviors did differ across type of technology. In terms of photo sharing, now this is with the data from the younger and older adults combined. Um, for photo sharing, remember the scenario that I presented earlier, uh, most of the behaviors reported um, were alleviatory in nature, so we, this was with more than expected frequency people were reporting taking, dealing with their privacy after the fact, so after a photo had already been taken. Um, and avoidance behaviors were reported with less frequency than we would have expected. So, you know, this is interesting from a design perspective if we're saying if, if you want to design for privacy in terms, of, uh, in terms of photos, maybe you want to encourage people to avoid, uh, engage in more avoidance behaviors, and maybe you want to make that possible from a design perspective. On the other hand, since people are already really used to dealing with their privacy in terms of alleviation, maybe that's where we should focus. In terms of identity theft, people uh, reported more avoidance behaviors and fewer modification behaviors than we would have expected. With respect to health disclosure, people reported more modification behaviors and fewer alleviatory behaviors. Location tracking, people reported far more avoidance behaviors than, than either, either other type of um, behavior. Surveillance, there were no statistical differences. And in terms of self-disclosure and relationship building, um, people reported modification behaviors more than expected and alleviatories le alleviatory behaviors less than expected. So in terms of key findings from this first study, um, one of the key findings was that commonalities do exist uh, among privacy behaviors. Um, I identified three categories of behaviors that were reported um, consistently across participants and across uh, technologies. And those were avoidance behaviors, modification behaviors, and alleviatory behaviors. Overall, we found that older adults engage in more avoidance behaviors and younger adults uh, engage in more alleviatory behaviors. And we also found that reported behaviors did differ across types of technology. So in terms of design implications, what, what does this mean if we want to design new technologies that are privacy sensitive? Well, one option is to, is to potentially design for common behaviors. So in some of the scenarios I showed you, there, there were um, certain behaviors were more common. So for example, in photo sharing, alleviatory behaviors were, um, were the most common. So may, perhaps this indicates, like I said before, that people are used to already engaging in alleviatory behaviors to manage, their, to manage their privacy with respect to photo sharing. So perhaps that means, as designers, we should focus in that area since it's what people are already doing. Perhaps it already fits with their ideas about how to manage privacy in that space. So one idea would be to provide better sharing functionalities, better, way for, better ways for people to manage their photos after the fact, so after the photo has already been taken. The counterpoint to that is that perhaps we want to focus our energies on designing where behaviors are infrequent. So in ter again, coming back to the photo sharing scenario, if avoidance behaviors are less common, why is that? Is it because right now it's hard for us to tell when someone's taking a photo of us? Is it because we don't know what all is included in that photo? Um, why is it that right now we're not managing our, our, um, our privacy in terms of uh, avoidance behaviors? So maybe this opens up a possible design space for us to kind of think about different ways that we could allow people to manage their privacy in, in that way. 
Another thing that, that's important to consider based on this, um, on this analysis is that perhaps different strategies are going to work for different age groups and perhaps different, uh, different types of technologies. Another, another finding was that we can potentially translate these everyday behaviors, so some of the behaviors that I described before, into technological instantiation. So I'll, I'll give a couple of examples of those in the next slides. One behavior that people described as an everyday privacy behavior that they're already using is to check, right? So this helps me know what information is available out there about me, and that makes me feel more comfortable in terms of my privacy. So we can facilitate this, right? So if, if you're worried about financial privacy, one way you can help people manage that is to allow them to check on what information people have about them, what's going on on their credit card, um, and, and have that ability enable them, facilitate that sort of checking behavior. Another thing that we can do is provide detailed sharing functionality. So people reported that they were interested in being able to share very specific pieces of information with certain people while not sharing with others. A really great example of this is um, a technology out of UW called Friendbo, where the technology allows you to share different pieces of information based on common or shared knowledge. Um, so uh, with a, a girlfriend might know, a girlfriend or boyfriend might know a secret place that they have with, with their girlfriend or boyfriend, and so asking for that piece of information might then allow you to see information that you would want a girlfriend to see. Um, on the other hand, if it's the rugby team, maybe they might know, uh, everyone on the rugby team should know whose rooftop you, you celebrated at when you, when you beat Stanford in the rugby finals, and having that knowledge would allow you to have other pieces of access to personal information that would, would be appropriate for the, the rugby team to have. Uh, another another uh, technology that's is based on people's descriptions that occur in the focus groups is vague inspired design. So in a traditional age input, we might ask someone for very explicit information. So what's the month, what's the day, and what's the year of your birth? And that's as a designer, that's the way that I'm, I'm asking for people's age. But if we go back and think really about what is the reason that we need someone's age, what is, what's the technology that we're designing for, um, potentially we can use this vague inspired to design, which is where people described saying not giving full detail um, when they answered questions or when they were sharing information with people to allow us to really think about what information it is that we need. So if we're designing a birthday application, do we need to know what day of the month someone was, burn, uh, someone was born on so that we can send them a happy birthday card? Or is it that we really do need to know their exact age for, for potentially uh, a medical, um, medical system or something like that? But again, even in a medical system, you don't need to know that someone's born on April 15th. You just need to know that they're um, over 35, so they should start get starting to get cholesterol screenings. The idea here is really just to, it gets at this higher level issue of asking for exactly the information that you need instead of asking for every piece of information that you think, um, with, without really considering why it is that you need all of that information. In terms of theoretical implications, one of the things that um, has been put forth by a number of, of researchers that privacy canon does mean different things to different people. Um, well, I, I understand why that is, that is a commonly held belief. For, across a lot of studies, it seems like privacy behaviors and privacy definitions are, are very different across people. If you ask 100 different people, some of the people in this room have, have done studies like this, you, you will get very different answers quite often. But our empirical investigations revealed that there were similarities. There are some commonalities that we can point to, and these commonalities can potentially help us to come up with privacy-sensitive um, technologies that hopefully will work across people. For many behaviors, the purpose of, 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 of privacy was to withhold information from some people while simultaneously sharing it with specific other people. This is to some extent consistent with, consistent with Weston's view of privacy, um, who def Weston defines privacy as the control over when, how, and to what extent information about an individual is communicated with others. Now I will, 
uh, give a caveat to that, which is certainly not all of the findings um, in the study are consistent with, with a lot of what, what Weston had to say. But this particular idea of privacy as dealing with one specific piece of information and one recipient or, or one to many or many to one, but, but having that individual control over pieces of information and giving that to specific people seemed to be a common theme across a lot of this research. Another model of privacy is Altman's um, model of privacy regulation. And as you can see here, let's see if I point to it. <laughs> this, it seems like a very simple model, but the, the idea Altman ex ex describes um, privacy as, or a person as having um, a boundary around them and regulating this boundary like a cell membrane would be, right? So if there are pieces of information, pieces of information can pass through the cell out into, out into the world and out into the environment and out into other people. And this idea is not consistent with what I presented in the previous slide, saying that people want to share specific pieces of information with specific people. This model, Altman's model of privacy, would suggest that there are, there's a specific piece of information, either I keep that all to myself and I don't share it with anyone, or I allow it to pass this boundary and go out into the world. But I don't think that that's the way that, that, that people really, from a psychological perspective, have ideas about privacy. Instead, I've proposed this alternative model of privacy where you're sharing some information with some people, uh, maybe a lot of information with some other people, and maybe there's a lot of information that you don't want to share with very specific people. And this can all happen simultaneously, right? So all these things can co-occur at the same time, whereas in Altman's model of privacy regulation, either information is shared or it's not shared. So again, coming back to this design perspective, how do we support privacy? If this is our model of, of, of privacy, how, does, how do we support this? Well, one way is to focus right here on the X, and if people have decided that they don't want to share information, they don't want to give up information to a specific person, how can we facilitate that? How can we design to allow that to happen? Going back to the psychology literature, I looked at the idea of disclosure, which Girard defines as the act of revealing personal information to others. There are two specific things to point out here, and that is that it's a particular piece of information, and it's an intentional revealing of, piece of, of a piece of information. So that's the definition of disclosure. But what about unintentional disclosures? So this is an example of, um, of a, a little Facebook message, and what happened is the person here that, that was sent the message ended up responding to everybody on the Facebook message and, and realizes it um, and says, whoops, I, I had no idea I was responding to everybody. Right? And this is, you might all think back on this, have you ever used the respond, uh, reply to all button when you meant to only respond to one person? Uh, another example is when I'm emailing my advisor um, an image that he's asked for of me giving a presentation. So this is the photo that I was supposed to attach, and he was going to be very happy with that photo, but I accidentally attached a photo of me out partying it up, and he was not so happy that I was out partying instead of giving the presentation that I should have been, that I should have been given, been giving. So, so th in this case, I'm giving the wrong information to the right person, right? In the previous case, what happened was that the person responded to everybody, so they gave the information that they wanted to give, but they gave it to more people than they intended to. The last example um, that I'll give you is it's a very recent example that just happened in the, the Cornell Business School. Um, they, there, was, there were some admins there, and um, they were having uh, a steamy uh, affair over email, and um, they were married but not to each other. And so in this, this steamy email that they, uh, chain that they were having, the very last email that was sent by, I think it was by the gentleman, um, when he, when he sent it back, he accidentally CC'd the entire um, business school at Cornell. And so everyone, everyone in the business school received a copy of the entire chain of the email. Clearly, this was an unintentional, an unintentional disclosure. This person definitely did not mean to do that. And it had, I think, probably some serious consequences. So what's going on in these cases, right? 
people often reveal information to entities, people, other people, companies, government agencies that they don't wish to reveal. I've given you some examples before. I'll, I'll talk about some more examples in the future. This can be termed a misclosure or disclosure error. And this violates privacy um, from a human factors perspective, right? So it's these people are violating their own privacy when they unintentionally give out information to others that they don't want to have that information. To introduce this, this concept to you a little bit more fully, define misclosure as the unintentional act or process of revealing or uncovering or something that's uncovered in error or a disclosure accident. And this can happen, uh, I have a little a taxonomy, this can happen in a number of different ways where you can give intended information to an unintended recipient or unintended information to an unintended recipient. Um, and, and I can talk a little bit more about those here. So a recipient misclosure is when you give unintended information to an unintended recipient. And you can, an example of that is phishing. Um, so if, if I get a phishing email from, um, from my bank and they're asking me for financial information and uh, I give that to them, I mean to give the, the information that I'm giving, I just don't mean to give it to the fisher. I mean to give it to my bank. An information misclosure is when you give unintended information to the intended recipient. This is like the example before where I'm trying to send a photo to my advisor and I attached the wrong photo. A combination misclosure is when you give unintended information to an unintended recipient. So this would be if you accidentally hit forward um, on an email that you meant to delete. So you didn't mean for anyone else to get that information, um, but someone did. So to explore th whether or not um, misclosures were occurring sort of outside of these extreme examples that I gave before um, from the media, I ran a criti critical incident study um, using the critical incident technique. I had um, 27 younger adults and 30 older adults participate in critical incident interviews. Um, this is just a basic overview of what happened. People came in and uh, I gave them five minutes to, I explained kind of the idea of the study and I gave them five minutes to think about whether or not they had ever experienced a misclosure and then I asked them to tell me about any incidents that they had experienced and then repeat that for all incidents that they had that they recalled. The key questions that I was looking at in this study were do younger and older adults experience technology related disclosure errors and if so what type um, what's the incidence of each type of misclosure what factors so what design factors, what person factors, uh, create a situation where in individuals do misclose, and what individual factors increase or influence misclosure rates. So do younger and older adults uh, experience technology-related disclosure errors? Yes. Overwhelmingly, yes. Um, only five of the older adults that I interviewed uh, said that they could not recall a misclosure incident having occurred, and all of the younger adults said that they, they had experienced a misclosure incident themselves. Just, it, just as a, um, a quick thing here, how many people have ever experienced a misclosure? Okay. Not everybody, though. <laughs> Maybe if you think about it a little bit more. By the way, if you have really good ones, you should email them to me because I'm a collector of misclosures. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of the number of misclosure incidents that were reported, um, older and younger adults both reported about the same number of misclosure incidents, and that was about, about three per person. So, when people came in, they, on average, it was, it was about three that they, um, that they told me about. The types of misclosures that people reported um, did vary uh, with respect to age, um, but there were um, overall, uh, younger adults reported more information misclosures and young, older adults reported more recipient misclosures. Um, as we would have expected, there were fewer combination misclosures that were reported. Incidents that were reported had occurred relatively recently. Um, in both the younger, for both younger and older adults, in over half of the cases, the misclosures had occurred within the last six months prior to the study. Participants reported misclosures across a variety of systems, suggesting that, um, that, that the, the issue of misclosure spans um, 
a number of different technologies. Email was the most commonly reported technology um, for both younger and older adults. People reported also misclosures with cell phones, instant messaging systems um, for, for the younger adults only, um, text messaging, online social networking um, like Facebook, online shopping, and, and on down different um, kinds of technologies. Now, the, the differences here, I'm not going to really get into too much because there are differences in the technology usage by older and younger adults. So it's, it's certainly not, um, I certainly wouldn't hypothesize that it's the case that if older adults were using um, Facebook with the, the, the same frequency that the younger adults were, that there, there wouldn't be um, these huge differences in terms of uh, the type, the, the, the systems that happened with misclosures. Um, but anyway, again, the point is just that these occurred across a large variety of systems. Uh, and interestingly, they didn't, it, it wasn't the case that it was people who were brand new to these systems that were experiencing mis misclosure. In over half of the cases for both younger and older adults, participants had been using the system for uh, at least a year when the misclosure incident that they reported occurred. I asked people to um, talk to me about what they thought the, the system factors were that influenced this misclosure. So if I said, you know, what, what do you think, what about the technology made this misclosure happen? And um, there were some, some commonly reported things. So often autofill or predictive text was something that occurred that, that, that people thought was related to misclosure incidents. So for example, if um, I'm using a, an email program and I start typing a name, perhaps it autofills with the wrong name. So instead of John um, Smith, it's John Say or something like that, right? So it, it fills in the wrong, the wrong person's name. Um, interface or button proximity was something that, that happened. So if, if on a cell phone, if something was very close to each other or if an email, if, some, if two buttons were very close to each other, people thought this was what happened uh, in terms of them sending information to the wrong person or vice versa. Um, focus or cursor changing automatically. So there was an example of someone, I gave the example of, of an AIM versus a Trillion user um, earlier where someone would uh, alt tab and accidentally type in the wrong message to, to um, or type in a message to the wrong person. Um, or whether it was just the recipient was, was unclear. So just kind of general interface or visibility types of issues. Uh, in terms of when I asked people what factors, you know, what was it about their actions that contributed to the misclosure, there was also um, some, quite a bit of variety. But people most often just said, oh, I just wasn't paying attention or I was being careless and this is what, this is what led to the misclosure or I didn't double check or I was in a hurry. But again, there, were, there, were, there was quite a variety here. So in terms of summing up the, the misclosure study, the, the big finding from this study is that misclosures do indeed occur. So this is um, something new that I've identified and, and, and found based on this study that you know, all but five of the participants reported that they had personally experienced a, a misclosure. Misclosures occur across a variety of systems. This isn't limited to just um, just one kind of system, they happen, email, cell phones, things that we use all the time. More than half the time participants had at least one year using the system when a misclosure occurred. Um, so it wasn't that people are using a brand new system and they just didn't know how to use it and this is why a misclosure occurred. In general, participants were familiar with the systems that they were using when a misclosure occurred. Um, so I have some, I have a couple of examples. I think I'm just going to um, briefly describe them. These are actual examples from the study. Um, calling Brother Timmon is one of my older adults, and what, what she explained to me happening is that um, in her phone, her son's name is very similar to, uh, to a gentleman who works at the airport, works night shifts at the airport, and this participant, when she wanted to call her son, would often call Brother Timmon instead of calling her son and felt really bad about this because she would, she would wake him up when he was trying to sleep during the day. So this is a recipient misclosure where this, this older adult was calling, calling the wrong person and um, potentially uh, bothering him during the time that he was supposed to be um, sleeping. 
sending wrong photos, I've kind of explained that to you before. Um, in the MMORGP fail, uh, a participant was typing, giving their password or giving their character to uh, a friend of theirs, and instead of giving it to the friend, they ended up typing it in the wrong place and giving it to, to someone that they, they didn't intend to give it to. If you're interested, I, I'll be happy to share you more detailed examples of these. But the idea here is just that the people had kind of these rich stories about what was going on um, when in their misclosure experience. So some of these might seem kind of inconsequential, and maybe even the misclosures, when I asked you to raise your hand whether or not you had experienced a misclosure, you might think, yeah, I, I you know, sent, sent something to my friend that I meant to send to my mom, or it wasn't a big deal. Um, but that's not, really, that's not really the issue here. I gave you some examples where, they, where it is a big deal when misclosures occur, but also it's really important for us to think about this in different contexts. So if this is not Facebook, but now it's HealthBook, and this is where I'm sharing all of my health information with different healthcare providers, it becomes really important that I share the right information with the right people. And if I have, if I have sharing um, in, in privacy settings that look like this, that might, you know, it's based on what I found, it's, it's potentially a really, really difficult task to share with the right the right people. So if I want to share my x-rays with my physician, but I don't want to share my x-rays with my insurance company or, or whoever it is that I don't want to have that information, um, then we need to think about misclosures when we're designing health applications uh, as one example of a place where misclosure incidents could be really critical. Um, in fact, in, in health informatics and medical informatics right now, security and privacy is one of the key areas that is identified as a barrier to the adoption of systems that are, um, have the potential to really help control costs in health settings and also to make care better for the people who are, um, who are receiving care. So this is, a big, this is a big issue in medical informatics right now. Luckily, the, the implications for design um, have some really basic sorts of things that, that we can do from a human factors perspective to make, that they'll potentially have really big impacts. So in, in, you know, from human factors and HCI from uh, a very long time ago, people have known that, uh, that people will make mistakes when they're using a system. And implementing a simple undo feature, which um, Gmail just implemented this year, uh, if you accidentally send uh, mail to the wrong person, has the potential to um, let people fix this really b before it comes a pro becomes a problem. So if I send an email and I recognize immediately after I've sent it that it's gone to the wrong person, if I have an undo feature, I can take care of that. Now, of course, we would prefer to have a system where you just don't send it to the wrong person in the first place. But, but implementing an undo function in communication system is something that's really easy that can potentially have a large impact. Uh, another thing, another idea in terms of a design implication is what I call social WYSIWYG. So WYSIWYG, of course, a uh, concept that everybody knows about. But this is, you know, what you see is what you get in terms of who you're sharing information with and who and and what the information is. So if I want to share the photo with my advisor, if I want to email that to him, I should have some idea of what that photo is, not just a random string of numbers that my camera identifies the photo as. I should have some sort of preview of what I'm about to send to him so I can fix it before I actually give him that information. Um, in terms of summary, I've identified and categorized privacy behaviors across multiple technologies, revealing a number of design opportunities. Um, I've identified the system and psychological conditions under which, mis under which misclosures are likely to occur, and proposed a, a framework for continuing um, research on user privacy, and suggested some design strategies to improve, um, to improve user privacy. I would like to thank uh, everyone on my dissertation committee who was wonderfully helpful in this research, um, a number of, of students and colleagues that I worked with at Georgia Tech and also colleagues at, um, at IU who have uh, helped me think a lot about this research. And I'll be happy to um, take questions about anything that I've talked about today.
Um, I know you said during your speech that the users were at least familiar with the system. Do you think there was a difference between older and younger adults actually understanding how it worked and not just being familiar with how to use it? Um, that, that's a good question. You know, I didn't address how familiar, so, so how, I only address what people said in terms of they were familiar with the system, so it was, it was a Likert type scale that I asked them to rate their familiarity with um, the system. I didn't I didn't do any sort of analysis of the mental model, the underlying mental model that people had about about using a system. So I, I don't know that I would have a specific prediction on whether or not the older adults had um, a better idea of, of exactly what was going on in the system. Um, I think, and, and I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that it matters for this because. You know, I we we could argue these were the the younger adults were Georgia Tech younger adults that I used. So if you wanted to argue that um, to not misclose when using a system, you have to have a really thorough understanding of the system that you're using. Then y you might come back and say, well, these were Georgia Tech undergrads. Some of them are, you know, engineers and computer scientists. They probably have an idea of what's going on in the underlying system, and they still experienced misclosure. I mean, the guy at the the Cornell Business School was like a, a technology admin. So I don't, I, my, my guess is that there's probably not a huge relationship between um, having this really sophisticated underlying mental model of the technology and misclosure incidents. Shows. Did they also talk about, um, I'm sorry about that, did they indicate what they did following those disclosures, changing behavior, changing systems, changing technology, using these kind of things? Yes, and I, I explicitly asked about that in the interview. So after every misclosure that was reported, I asked um, participants what they did, had they experienced a, a similar misclosure afterwards, and if they changed any of the, uh, their behaviors. I, I didn't present that here, but um, in, in a lot of cases, people said, oh, I tried to pay more attention. Um, you did see in the one messaging system example where the, the, the younger adult reported changing from AIM when he misclosed, when he sent a message to the wrong recipient, he changed to using Trillion, where, where the automatic um, shuffling of the cursor didn't happen. So, so at least in some cases, people did change systems. Um, and, and given what I talked about in the first study, where people said you know, reported avoidance behaviors, um, certainly some of that was avoiding using certain technologies. And if, if you experience a misclosure, we're defining that as a violation of privacy, then you would anticipate potentially that avoidance behaviors would be one response to that. But I, I certainly I have the, the data, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Yes. Did, did you discuss how important the misclosures were? Like, was it just a, oops, I slipped, or was it, oh, man, this is really going to ruin, you know, blank? You guys are asking great questions. I, I did also ask about that. And in, the, in most cases, as you might expect, it, the, the, it was relatively inconsequential. So it was just you accidentally replied to the wrong person or something, and it was just a boring email that nobody cared about, or you accidentally sent the, a text to the wrong person or something like that. But, but, but in some cases, I, ha I did have um, a few very interesting cases where people said this was a huge, this had a huge impact. It was a really big deal. Were there different, did, did you look at that in your study? Did you look at... Um, which, what percentage were just small slips because I wasn't paying attention versus what were actual major problems? Well, I, I think that you, there, you're, there's two things going on there. So one is like, was it, was it just a, was it just a little slip or, and then one is consequences. And I think, you know, a, a little slip, right, could have giant consequences. Like the, 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 the Cornell one that I shared earlier, right, that was a little slip, potentially has huge consequences. I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, but, but so there's two things um, going on there. I do have the data about how people rated their own, like how big of a deal um, each, each misclosure incident that they reported was. So was this, was this really bad or was it not so bad? So I have that data. Um, I haven't really done a lot, done, done a lot with it other than to say that um, it was a relatively small percentage that had large consequences associated with it or the way that people reported it. 
like maybe all of the major consequences were email only and then, you know, slipping up the IM wasn't a big deal. Things, things like that. Like, if, is there a certain type of technology that is more likely to cause a serious infraction than just a, just a slight? Right, I haven't done that analysis. That's a good idea. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. privacy norms that people have. What about the situation of misclosure that you don't even realize is a misclosure? Uh, say, for instance, the undergraduate who thinks it's a great idea to put their Facebook address on their resume, um, not realizing that that means their, their prospective employer can see their trip to South Padre last year. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, clearly in this study, I didn't get, I didn't ask people about things that they were, they were unaware of. But, but, but definitely, I'm, I'm starting to um, think more about these um, secondary uses of information, secondary disclosures, and also the, the, the combination of information that people really have no idea what the consequences are. There are a lot of people who have done some, done really good work in that area, and um, I, I'm trying to think about how that integrates. Um, into this area, but yeah, you know, I didn't get any of those kinds of things in in the interviews that I that I was doing. Yes. Um, this is not <clears throat> actually about your research. Uh, this sort of goes beyond uh, that. I uh, wonder uh, what your take is on uh, this. Uh, I don't know philosophical issue. Uh, it's a standard joke in uh, information security as well. <laughs> uh, process. I disagree with him. I think that also the computers should be unplugged. Uh, <laughs> but but, but, uh, but uh, uh, given that uh, your research is very important because you look at a uh, very important aspect of where humans make uh, uh, errors, uh, your suggestion for improvement of the design uh, makes sense also. Are you at all optimistic? somehow technologically minimize the amount of human uh, error. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we have a long history in human factors of, of uh, uh, looking at a problem, seeing where errors are occurring, addressing those systematically, and coming up with design alternatives that take into consideration how people approach um, how people uh, uh, approach a technology, how what what's going on in their workflow, and being able to make changes that have huge impacts in terms of the the kinds of the number of errors that occur and what the consequences of those errors are. So we have a. Why, why am I still res uh, responding to BCC messages? <laughs> well, I I just did this research uh, um, this year, so give me give me a, a couple years, <laughs> but I'm trying. Yeah, this is this is this is brand new stuff, and I I think. I think I'm the first person that's applied kind of this error framework to the, the, the human factors problem of privacy. Um, so I'm hoping that that approach will, will be beneficial and that will actually, some of the, some of the design suggestions, which again are, are really simple sort of design suggestions. I haven't, I'm not a designer. I haven't come up with some, you know, ridiculously Is brilliant, you elegant. Are you sure you want to send this message? No, no, that, I, I've heard that, I've had that question actually quite a few times, and no, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's the way to go, but there are a lot of other things that we can do um, that, that aren't just bugging people. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Could you please elaborate on your critique on Hoffman theory? You work in an disclosure. You look at it as a binary thing. If you run the school, you don't want the school. And then you discuss Hartman theory and willingness to disclose. And we have one I minute, and I'm not sure that I understand your question. <laughs> in the middle of your presentation, yes. you discuss Hartman's work. Yes. As I understand, Hartman's work is about willingness to disclose, not about disclosure. No, it's it, it's not about it's not about misclosure, but it is about. Um, boundary regulation and disclosure, right? So, so Altman definitely does address this this idea of of um, 
of letting pieces of information flow outward from this, this, this cell membrane type of idea. So actually, an interest, uh, uh, something that's related to that is that based on Altman's model, you would expect there to be more combination misclosures than any other type of misclosure. If, if he didn't have the concept of misclosure when he was working in, the, in this area. But based on that model, if you were to, to carry it forward and predict what kind of misclosures would occur, you would predict combination misclosures, whereas in the, the alternative model of privacy, you would expect more information or, or recipient misclosures, which is what we indeed found. So there, there are some similarities. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking. Well, what that meant is um, there's a line between closure and misclosure and closure. There are situations that people are willing to disclose, but it falls in the category of disclosure. And this is the focus of the information system community from a business perspective. How do you make people to be willing to disclose the information that they are not willing to do it at a normal time? Okay. So the that's what I meant. Those boundaries. I see. And the fair information process. If yeah, I, I I stopped it at the I sort of stopped it at the place where people had decided that they didn't want to give information. So I took that as an assumption. I wasn't playing with that idea of trying to get people to to move that that boundary or either way. It was I've decided that I want to disclose this or I've decided who I want to disclose this to, and then I make an error after that decision has been made. So again, and that's basing it within the error framework. That's one of the, the, the intention to do something is a really important part of that. It, it, but it doesn't deal with the, how do you get to the intention to do it? Yes? Um, in your study, when you brought people in to talk to you, um, were, were they all Americans? The reason I ask is because one of the things that you mentioned was that the large problem was people just weren't paying attention or were just being careless. I did not call, I did not say that that was a large problem actually this that's what people when people reported well right but so coming from a human factors perspective I don't think I never think that it's it's the user's fault what's going on I think that there are design things that lead to the consequences of, of these misclosures I don't I don't think that you should have to uh, be at this constant high state of vigilance um, every time you're using your email to make sure that you don't misclose. I don't think that's the solution at all. But but sorry. Anyway. Uh, I, was just, I was just going to wonder if maybe that's a cultural thing that we're just not paying quite as much attention, or that we're more often multitasking than we should be. Um, so to answer the first part of your question, it, that was about the the population that I used. Um, uh, everyone was living in the United States that I used it, that, that, was, uh, that participated in this particular study. There were um, a variety of backgrounds. Um, I had uh, um, African Americans, I had uh, Asians, I had... Um, um, different majors. <laughs> different majors, yeah. So it wasn't, I, I don't think I presented it here, but it was, it was a relatively um, diverse group of people that I ended up interviewing, but I didn't I didn't. Um, I didn't explicitly seek out people of, of different cultures for this for this study because it was just the, the first study in this area. But I don't know um, again how much of this has to do with multitasking or that kind of thing. I think um, I don't. Uh, to repeat to reiterate what I said before, I don't think we should have to be trying really, really hard and exerting all kinds of effort just to make sure that we're not misclosing and there are some design things that we can do to make it that, that, that's, um, that, that that's not necessary and people still won't misclose. to thank you all for coming out on such a windy and cold day during uh, during the week before finals thank you all for being here <laughs>